Hi everyone, and welcome to week five. Um, before we get into the topic for this week, let's just have a little bit of a chat about the assessment. Um, now, assessment one is a research exercise, sort of like a, a short essay. That's worth a thousand words and 30% of your overall uh, mark for the unit. Now this is looking at a specific case study. Um, I should also mention, as you can see up on the screen, it's due um, the 1st of September as well. Now, it's focused on a specific case study um, relating to a shooting incident that happened in King's Cross back in 2012. The specific details are of this case are explained in the learning guide and I think this week I've put up um, a link to a YouTube video of footage from the incident. Anyway, um, this assessment requires you to write a critical account in essay format of how this incident may have been prevented through one of the following crime prevention strategies um, which is listed below. Now what you need to achieve in your writing of this assessment is demonstrate why the crime prevention strategy that you have chosen um, for this case is the best one and acknowledge any limitations of that particular approach. So, for example, if you were to go with the strategy from this week, social prevention, you'd need to explain why social prevention could help um, or would be a relevant prevention strategy uh, for this particular incident. And don't just say, oh yeah, I think it's a good strategy. Actually, you know, give a few reasons based on what the strengths and assumptions of the approach are. And yes, don't forget to mention the limitations as well. Now, last week we looked at social prevention, and we needed to remember that uh, social prevention is a holistic approach. It doesn't need to be named crime prevention for it to be effective, and in fact, in fact, sorry, labeling it as such could be counterproductive. So it should be broad and as inclusive as possible. Um, it functions at the structural level, trying to address issues regarding social distributions of community resources. Now, political processes and dynamics intrinsically shape crime prevention at the policy planning and project level. We also noted um, several challenges um, that social prevention needs to be consultative uh, and engage with communities. And it needs to resonate at both the practical and symbolic affective levels. And most importantly, the more ingrained social prevention is as part of everyday routine or practice, the more effective it becomes. This week we are looking at situational crime prevention. We'll go over a definition, look at some similarities with epidemiological thinking, discuss some of the history behind this um, perspective, talk about the situational approach and its theoretical background, um, touch upon situational crime prevention methodology, uh, look at the opportunity reducing techniques framework, consider the effectiveness um, in terms of evidence, and also have a think about the evaluation methodology and some of the challenges behind this. So situational crime prevention presents itself um, as a very evidence-based and methodical approach, which is why we have this mention of a methodology and evaluation and so on.
Now up here I have a uh, quote that serves as a useful working definition for situational crime prevention. And that is that situational crime prevention seeks to reduce opportunities for specific categories of crime by increasing the associated risks and difficulties and reducing the rewards. Now this goes back to previous weeks where we've mentioned um, the, the crime triangle framework and thinking about the motivated offender as a rational actor who seeks to maximize their utility um, and maximize the cost and benefit or sorry optimize their cost benefit ratio when it comes to deciding whether to commit a criminal act. So you may recall um, from week two, we mentioned the classical liberal and rationalistic underpinnings of a lot of crime prevention thinking, the homo prudens model from week two. And now situational crime prevention, unlike social prevention last week, looks at the where, when, and how uh, crime incidents occur. Now this is different compared to other criminological perspectives in that situational crime prevention or SCP seeks to predict criminal behavior by focusing on the proximal or immediate causes of crime in the settings where they occur. Now this is an alternative to just arresting and punishing our way out of crime. In other words, situational crime prevention is about a reduction in crime opportunities. Now, the, there are some similarities between uh, um, situational crime prevention and epidemiology and public health. And um, if we think of epidemiology as uh, concerned with the study of variables, vectors, and factors that affect disease spread, um, Situational crime prevention sees criminology as the systematic study of the nature, extent, cause, and control of law-breaking behavior. More specifically, with regard to situational crime prevention and epidemiology, um, you know, on the one hand, you have traditional medicine that treats individuals uh, as a way of prevention. You have traditional criminology that looks at the criminal nature of individual offenders to reduce crime. And then you have situational crime prevention, um, which is about altering environments that host crime behavior to make, um, to make it less suitable for offending. So the individual propensity of offenders, their individual characters, uh, are less important as a means of crime prevention. Now, we might draw a comparison here with harm reduction policy from public health. Um, harm reduction is um, an approach to uh, drug policy and drug harms that addresses the material conditions of drug use to reduce the amount of harm uh, caused by um, consuming drugs. Now, this is quite distinct from... Um, what you'd call a prohibitionist approach or an absence-based approach uh, to drug harms. So rather than trying to address the individual propensity of people to use drugs or the social contexts that facilitate drug use, you know, some of the kinds of things we've been discussing in this course already, um, such as disadvantage, um, uh, uh, poor... Um, investments in, uh, you know, uh, social and family and other institutions and all of that kind of thing. Instead of addressing that individual propensity, um, it instead just tries to alter the environment of drug consumption. Um, for example, with needle and syringe programs, um, these provide sterile injecting equipment to reduce the spread of bloodborne viruses such as HIV and hepatitis C, 
um, which is in that way reducing one of the real health harms of uh, certain forms of drug consumption. And so the reason I bring up that comparison is to say we're not looking at altering the individual uh, would-be offender in situational crime prevention. We're not looking at changing their uh, you know, internal propensity or their underlying character. We're trying to make the situation, the immediate environment, um, you know, less conducive to, to the harm of crime. Now, the history of this um, situational crime prevention approach comes from the 1970s when the British government um, reviewed and evaluated conventional methods of crime control. And it established that variations of crime in different settings could actually be explained by variations in the opportunities, incentives, and risks associated with that crime. And they took the view that situational features of the environment functioned as determinants for criminal offending. Now, situational crime prevention also draws inspiration from crime prevention through environmental design, CPTED, which we'll look at in a bit more detail next lecture, and problem-oriented policing from the US context. Now, just briefly on crime prevention through environmental design. This um, uh, uh, framework had its origins in the fields of architecture as well as urban studies. And a key concept was this idea of defensible space, which linked um, environmental conditions and crime. And it's sort of, I mean, we'll go into this in more detail next week, but it's saying that um, residents in a particular area create defensible space and reduce the opportunities of crime by showing would-be offenders that this is our area, this is our local space, we care about it, we're invested in it, um, we don't want you to commit crime here. Now, defensible space and crime prevention through environmental design ideas um, affected the development of situational crime prevention. Um, particularly in terms of specifying and arranging particular situational prevention techniques. With the problem-oriented policing approach, um, this directed police activity to identify underlying problems that give rise to criminal incidents, okay? So again, we're looking at the event of the criminal act itself rather than for example, the nature of the offender, which was what social prevention was looking at. Um, and this relied on the expertise and creativity of line officers to study problems carefully and develop solutions. Uh, it involved closer engagement with the public and the community to make sure that the needs of citizens um, were being addressed. So the Scanning Analysis Response Assessment, SARA process, uh, is a similar or, or the same one used in situational uh, prevention techniques as well. Now, the overall situational approach seeks to reduce the harms caused by crime. And it does this by altering the immediate or situational factors in environments where crime regularly occurs. Going back to some of the terminology that we've used so far, the situational approach seeks to address the proximal factors. Now those conditions or factors that are closest in time to particular incidents, particular events of crime, are understood to be more responsive to manipulations. What does that mean? That means that those factors that happen within a very close time before and uh, well before sorry 
um, crime actually takes place are those that are going to be the most responsive to the way that we intervene and try to change them. Now let's just take a step back and see where the situational approach sits um, in terms of um, you know what we've talked about so far in, in, in the course. Last week we looked at social prevention which addresses the broad social structural factors. Uh, now in this dodgy diagram I've drawn for you, um, that's the sort of blue cloud um, or outside or surrounding the crime triangle in the middle. Now, situational crime prevention is addressing these proximate factors inside this green triangle. You have the target or the victim, you have um, uh, lack of capable guardianship, and you have a motivated offender. So that's the logic of situational crime prevention, and it's also premised on the assumption of um, a rational actor um, as the motivated offender. So everything inside that um, green triangle, I guess, in that space of proximate factors is where situational crime prevention locates itself. The structural context, the, the blue cloud, is taken as a given. So we don't try and look at those aspects, we're just looking at the immediate uh, incident itself. Now there are four major components um, in situational prevention, according to Clark. Now the, there's a theoretical foundation, a standard methodology, a set of opportunity reducing techniques, and a body of evaluated practice, that is, scholarly empirical evidence. Now when it comes to theoretical background, there are three um, perspectives, or three main perspectives, in forming situational prevention. You have the rational choice perspective. Now, we've mentioned that a few times already. That's the whole cost-benefit, risk-reward, um, the, 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 the rational um, actor as the motivated offender in the crime triangle. Uh, the routine activity approach, which is that crime triangle itself, You've got the motivated offender, the target, and the lack of capable guardianship. Go back to week two, we mentioned that. Um, that's informing situational crime prevention, and that should have been quite clear in the previous um, diagram I showed. And you also have crime pattern theory, um, which is discussing regula regularities of crime across geographic space. So that's this talk of hotspots and so on. Now, this rational choice perspective um, posits crime as purposive behavior. So, again, going back to the classical liberal philosophy, uh, homo prudens, that model of rational man. Potential offenders are viewed as rational decision makers. Crime is a choice, and, and offenders assess the costs and benefits of a particular act. And if the risk and the effort outweighs the potential reward of committing a crime, then the criminal act becomes less likely. That's what the rational choice perspective is saying. So what that means for situational crime prevention is that the situational environment can be manipulated to adjust the real or perceived desirability of offending, right? It's about um, making the risk not worth the reward. So this helps to explain why some places experience more crime than others and why some targets become victimized while others do not. Now let's revisit the routine activity approach. Again, week two, that crime triangle thing. There are three elements for crime to occur. The motivated offender, a suitable target, and a lack of capable guardianship. And what this does for situational prevention is it shows how eliminating um, any of these three elements in the triangle 
can reduce opportunities for offending. Right? We we tamper with the motivation of the offender. We make a target less suitable, or we uh, provide capable guardianship of a particular space. For example, CCTV or effective guest control policies, i.e. having a bouncer out the front of your club. Now this brings us to the third element of crime pattern theory, which helps to explain regularities in crime behaviours across geographic space. So this is where um, um, this talk of hotspots comes from, because it's referring to how crime becomes concentrated at certain places in certain times, right? Now, there are two forms of hotspot. There are generators and facilitators. When it comes to generators, these refer to places that attract many potential victims and offenders for non-criminal purposes. So these might be bus stops, for example. And these happen to facilitate um, crime because of the convergence of people and opportunities at a particular um, point. Facilitators, on the other hand, are places that are known to offenders where crime regularly takes place, so offenders are attracted to these locations um, to commit crime. Now, crime pattern theory helps situational prevention, um, it helps it to identify and think about the locations where interventions need to take place, um, and and establish uh, tailored methods for each area, you know, depending on what type, if it's a generator or a facilitator hotspot. Situational crime prevention methodology involves problem identification, analysis of the problem, the formulation and implementation of responses, uh, impact assessment, and the dissemination of findings. So that um, you know, includes collecting relevant data, analyzing responsible factors for specific problems, and then figuring out which tactics to apply, evaluating the intervention, and then not just keeping that evaluation to yourself, but publishing those findings. The opportunity reducing techniques of situational prevention are centered or organized around five axioms. These are increasing efforts, increasing risks, reducing rewards, reducing provocations, and removing excuses. Now I've got a sort of mind map up here to help uh, think about this opportunity reducing techniques. Um, you don't need to lose sleep over memorizing every single specific technique, but it does help to recognize the five axioms. Increased effort, increased risk, reduced provocation, remove excuses, reduce rewards, right? So some of the things under um, increased effort include things like target hardening, uh, controlling access, screening exits, deflecting offenders, and so on. Controlling tools and weapons, sorry. When it comes to increasing risks, this is things like extending guardianship, assisting with natural surveillance, reducing anonymity, so getting people to take their helmets off and so on. Um, strengthening formal surveillance, all of that sort of thing. When it comes to reducing provocations, some of the um, examples are um, avoiding disputes, so separating rival um, fans from different football teams, for example, in a stadium. Reducing emotional arousal, so making sure people don't get too fired up. Um, neutralizing peer pressure and so on. Reducing rewards, um, so this is like concealing targets, hiding something, yeah, or removing them altogether from the space, identifying property, putting your name on stuff, tagging it, um, 
and removing excuses, some some uh, techniques from that include clearly setting rules, posting instructions. So whenever you see signage up in parks telling you not to do stuff, uh, trespassers will be um, prosecuted and so on. Now there's over four decades of evaluation evaluation sorry research um, in favor of the effectiveness of situational prevention. Um, it's uh, demonstrably an effective way for reducing the harms of crime. Um, there may be a philosophical question around, is this different to reducing crime itself? Um, but that's a question for you to ponder about, um, you know, more generally. So this evidence is reflected in both specific case studies and comprehensive reviews of evaluation studies. Um, that have used various classification schemes and evaluation methodologies. Now these are just a few examples of the way that um, the research suggests situational prevention is effectiveness, just to give you a sense of the, um, of the, of the big picture. For example, one evaluation has found that um, three quarters of the interventions that they looked at led to an overall crime reduction. Recreational settings seem to be um, the most uh, effective um, places, while public thoroughfares tended to have uh, or demonstrate less effectiveness when it came to situational prevention. Other researchers have used different classification schemes um, and organized uh, situation, situation um, prevention uh, based on the frequency of use. Well, basically what that's saying is that 79% of the interventions that they analyzed used just 7 out of the 25 situational techniques. So that's sort of suggesting that, yeah, there's, you know, a whole range of techniques, but, you know, just a handful of them tend to get used um, more often uh, than the rest. So we can see here from, uh, on this table, uh, from an evaluation study, um, that um, situational uh, intervention um, programs uh, tended to be, you know, more effective when it came to residential uh, areas, retail, um, and so on. And I'll just leave that um, chart up there for you uh, to have a look at and make some notes as well. Now we come to um, what I mentioned about how a handful of interventions get used most of the time. And you can see on this chart that um, you know, CCTV, lighting, environmental design, um, access control, things like that um, tend to be um, the most common um, interventions and the most effective of those. Again, I'll leave the chart up for you to sort of read at your own pace and make notes.
you know, there are a few challenges when it comes to evaluation that make conclusions and sort of generalizing findings to other circumstances a bit difficult. Um, this is just the nature of, um, of things. Now, the first thing is that situational prevention is in itself a process. Every situational intervention is designed for a specific problem to address specific risk factors. So randomized experiments, randomized controlled trials simply are just not possible. The second point is that situational prevention is usually part of a package of multiple interventions rather than a single technique. So something we want to think about is how do we isolate uh, specific elements from the social context within which they are applied. The third point is that evaluations are usually conducted after an intervention has been implemented. So you can't um, randomly assign situational measures and results. And this is, again, I mean, that, that just would not make sense to randomly assign situations and uh, measures because each intervention is designed for a specific problem and specific risk factors. It's very context sensitive. The fourth challenge is that um, there are a few issues unique to situational prevention. Crime displacement, diffusion of benefits, and anticipatory benefits. Now, with crime displacement, that means that crime may instead just be moved to another place or time or target or different offenders as a result of the intervention. When it comes to diffusion, we're talking about how the positive impacts of the prevention can spread to other times and places. And anticipatory benefits refers to how there can be premature reductions in crime before the intervention is put in place. So, for example, would-be offenders become aware of new measures or new policies, uh, new laws that are about to be implemented, and so they just stop. Um, they don't deem it uh, a worthwhile reward to their risk. Another question, the fifth one, is whether prevention measures are worthwhile in relation to their costs, i.e. are they cost effective? And the sixth is that sometimes you have the situation of using uh, improper tactics for specific uh, crime or problem behaviours. So that is really getting at using measures, using situational prevention measures without really being aware of their theoretical assumptions. Now just a comment about evaluations and methodologies and so on. So does, does this, do these challenges with evaluation methodology, does this mean that we can't trust situational crime prevention? Well of course that's not what it means. All it means is that situational prevention takes evaluation and evidence very seriously. It's very, um, you know, uh, uh, critical and reflexive about that point. Just because we can't make a sample to population, i.e. a statistical generalization, doesn't mean that we can't trust situational prevention in general. We can still make analytical generalizations, such as theorizing, and case-to-case -case transfers, which means applying knowledge from one case to make a better informed analysis or better decisions about very similar other cases. Right, the main issue is we can't just make a general theory of situational prevention because, as the name suggests, it depends on the situation. So just a few concluding points. There are four decades of empirical evaluation showing that this is an effective approach. Just as immunization, going back to the epidemiology and public health metaphor, just as immunization seeks to prevent the spread of contagious diseases, um, situational crime prevention approaches um, seek to use opportunity-reducing techniques before large-scale crime problems arise. So, uh, going back to my harm reduction example earlier in the lecture, you might think of opportunity reduction as harm reduction when it comes to crime. 
reducing the opportunities for crime to manifest or materialize in the circumstances where it occurs. So let's just try and um, link this all together. Situational crime prevention entails a specific set of theoretical assumptions. We have the rational choice perspective, the routine activities approach, and crime pattern theory. It uses an evidence-based methodology to inform its ongoing practice. That means it conducts evaluations and impact assessments. There are five key axioms with various associated techniques in situational crime prevention. These include increasing efforts, increasing risks, reducing reward, reducing provocation, and removing excuses. Situational crime prevention has been evaluated as an effective way for reducing the harms of crime. It also needs to be context-specific and problem-oriented. It is situational. And it's also important to remember that the evaluations of the interventions are more complex than just doing a randomized experiment or a randomized controlled trial. It's about a more sophisticated understanding of how each intervention relates to its specific situation and how similar situations can be compared and contrasted to make better decisions. Now here are some things to think about over the rest of this week. What are the key differences between situational crime prevention and the social prevention approach examined last week? How is the individual, the motivated offender, addressed differently in these two prevention approaches? And the third thing to think about is, moving beyond a simple either-or distinction, can you think of situations where one form of prevention could be more appropriate than the other? And obviously, why is that the case? Now, next week, we will be looking at crime prevention through environmental design. Um, now, this is sort of similar but also quite different which is why you know it's a separate topic but it predates situational prevention but there have been developments um since anyway the point is next week's reading is crow and fennelly 2013 and here are some things to think about while doing that reading and preparing for next week now that is although similar how does crime prevention through environmental design differ from situational crime prevention? How does crime prevention through environmental design relate to Chicago school and ecological approaches to crime? And does CPTED work on the motivated offender, the target, or the capable guardianship aspects of the crime triangle? Or maybe we need to think beyond that. Anyway, on that note, uh, good luck, and I'll touch base with you next week.